rioting on the streets of Jayapura, capital of West Papua, a remote province of Indonesia in the Western Pacific. At stake, Indonesian control of the world's biggest copper and gold mine. Four Indonesian soldiers are stoned to death, dozens of West Papuan students disappear. West Papua is one of the most remote places on earth. Few journalists come here, fewer still avoid arrest by the Indonesian military. The nearest Indonesian soldiers are 10 kilometres away. We spent three weeks undercover in West Papua, meeting the dissidents in hiding and the tribal warriors who claim their ancient culture, dating back thousands of years, is being erased by force. <laughs> It's nine o'clock at night. We're trying to avoid the police as we slip out of Wamana in the remote central highlands of West Papua. We have an appointment to keep. We've been taken to meet people who to varying degrees have been affected by resisting or standing up to uh, Indonesian rule. But we have to be careful about being seen um, filming. We arrive at a safe house and are hurried inside to stay out of sight of the Indonesian authorities. Waiting for us is a group of tribal elders. They tell us some of them have traveled for days to be here. He said it's very dangerous for them to come into the town like this and be all together. The most senior tribal leader intones a list of names. Twelve friends he claims have been killed by Indonesian forces. Then he said, but there are thousands more that we, that we can't name, we can't even count. There have been so many killed. He's saying, well, we're only a few people standing here now, and uh, if we continue the way we're going, we're going to be wiped out by the Indonesians. Suddenly, a radio message. The Indonesian police have pulled up outside. So we've just been told to uh, move quickly. Somebody here? Let me know. have to go. Can you make right. care of the back? Okay. Why? Somebody come? Yeah, somebody come. Okay. With the car. Okay. Everybody okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'd been in Papua for less than 48 hours yeah. and we're already ducking the police. Wamana is barely 50 years old, a glorified airstrip in the West Papuan highlands. Since 1969, it's been an Indonesian centre of government, and tribal feelings against Indonesia run high. Getting into West Papua is very difficult. Uh, all journalists are banned, and those who do come here are closely watched. So we've come as tourists. That means we have to operate very carefully, and we can't film anything openly. This is our cover a tribal gathering that's become an annual tourist attraction. West Papua's tribes lived here in isolation for 30,000 years. Undiscovered by Europeans until the 30s, they were annexed by Indonesia in the late 1960s. Their culture is still rooted in the Stone Age. It feels a bit sad because the Indonesian officials sit up on the podium and direct things and the local Papuans seem to perform for them almost. Welcome to Amina and enjoy the beauty of its nature and culture. It is unquestionable that Indonesia is the ultimate in diversity. Many West Papuans believe diversity is a polite word for occupation. The local governor's speech is delivered behind ranks of Indonesian police. 
and there's a lot of tribal Papuans here, and their weapons, however primitive, are real. Since 1969, hundreds of thousands of Indonesians have been subsidised to settle in West Papua. They run most of the major businesses. The local Papuans trade in Wamana's streets. Seems very calm at the moment, but just beneath the surface, there's a uh, receiving anti-Indonesian sentiment. Just a few months ago here, two locals were shot by police when they were protesting outside the local courthouse against the arrest of one of their leaders. Our Papuan contacts wanted us to meet the families of people who they claimed had been killed in the most recent Indonesian crackdown. To get to it, we had to travel a road lined with military garrisons. Outside one of them, local Papuans were being drilled by the army for a special event, Indonesian Independence Day. Okay, so that's the uh, police station. Everywhere, I, everywhere we, we have to present this Surat Jalan, which is a special pass, and that gives you permission then to go to all these towns, but it's obviously a way of the police knowing exactly where all foreigners are at all times. The underground has adopted careful tactics to avoid detection. We were dropped off and led from the road deep into the forests. Here, we met a second contact. Sorogo told us he had been on the run hiding out for five years. My father is Indonesia. Killed, Killed by Indonesia? Yeah, my friends, family. Did you see that? Yeah. How old were you? Maybe. Uh, you know, seven. Seven. So they shot them dead. You know, fox or buck. Cut. It, yeah. With you know, you know, like knife. Ma got, machete. Yeah. How do you feel now? I feel yeah strong. Because why my father died? Why Indonesia killed my father and mother? I want to fight. Sorogo led us another two kilometres through the forest and into a tribal village, where it seemed everyone was in mourning. people that they've lost and in particular they're crying about the young men that were shot by the Indonesian police in Jayapura in March in the protests. The crying was an age-old traditional ritual. Sorogo told us the clashes in the West Papuan capital had claimed the lives of two young men from this village alone. The mothers were still wearing mud as a sign of mourning. This woman told me she'd lost two sons. One died in the protest, she believes. The other fled to Australia to escape. Her son was taken away by the police and has never been seen again. Dusake also lost her son in student protests in Jayapura two years ago. She's very angry about Indonesia being here. She says this is our land and she would have wanted her son to protest um, against Indonesia. She was so heartbroken, she says, by his death, she cut her fingers off as a sign of grief. 